Hello and welcome to this time of encouragement. Through the encouragement of the scriptures, we receive hope. So every time we get into God's word, we're going to receive wonderful, heavenly, spiritual riches and blessings. I just know that God's going to speak to us and that seed of his word will be planted in our heart and have a good effect in our lives. I hope you leave better than when we first started. This is not a waste of time. This is a time blessed. This is a time set apart and holy because God is with us. He makes all the difference. If you have your Bible, I invite you to grab it, to hold it in your hands. Let us identify, own, possess, Make the word of God our own. If you would say these words in faith with me. This is my Bible. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. Today I will be taught the word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise be to God. We're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Let's pick it up in verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. The feast of unleavened bread is a week seven-day week celebration. Passover is the holy day which begins the feast. Two Sabbaths will occur during the last week of Jesus' earthly life. Two Sabbaths. There's the Sabbath day that we know as Saturday, beginning at Friday evening and concluding Saturday evening. And then there's Passover day. So why is this important? Because the chief priests and scribes want to kill Jesus and they want to kill him before the holy days. They, uh, they have to do their work before the holy days, before the sun goes down, which signifies the start of the holy day. They don't know how to do it but they are intent on putting Jesus to death and for their uh, plan to work Satan has chosen the right person to use they don't fear God but they sure fear the people verse 3 then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot who was one of the number of the twelve he went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Why would Judas Iscariot want to betray Jesus? What did Jesus do to him? What happened in those three years of walking with Jesus, watching Jesus, listening to Jesus, that made him Satan's chosen one? We're not given all the details, but we are told that Jesus knew all along about Judas. We are told that prophecy foretold his betrayal to Jesus. We are told that Judas was in charge of the money and that he stole from their treasury, their, their money bag. We are told that he was upset when a very expensive alabaster ointment was poured on Jesus. And he said something like, oh, we should have sold this and given the money to the poor. But he's a thief. What we can gather and what we know about Judas is clear. He does not believe in Jesus. His heart is hard toward him. He loves money. He's a thief. And none of the twelve suspected him. He agreed to take money 
30 pieces of silver for handing over Jesus and to do it away from the crowd. Truly, it is Satan, though, working to have Jesus put to death. But Judas is a willing servant of Satan. Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a, a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, Where is the guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples, and he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he told them, and they prepared the Passover. It's, it, it's interesting to consider what day this is, right? Is it Thursday? Well, church tradition says that this is Thursday. Uh, Good Friday is the day Jesus was crucified, but it could also be Wednesday. Why Wednesday? Notice that this, this is the day of preparation before the Passover. It could be. Jesus had Peter and John go find a place for them to eat. Nothing outright miraculous, right, about what Jesus instructs them to go do. Yet with a closer look, a man carrying a jar of water does not fit. Men in those days did not carry jars of water. This was the duty of the woman. When you see a man carrying a jar of water, follow him. That's a clear sign, right? Oh, there he is. Now we go follow him. This may have been John Mark, or we, the 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 one who penned the Gospel of Mark. This may this may be John Mark, the owner of the house. Uh, would be his mother mentioned in uh, the Book of Acts, chapter twelve, verse twelve. It could be. A large upper room has been furnished and prepared for Jesus and his disciples. Jesus had come to Jerusalem many times. This isn't his first time. So he must know this man and has previously arranged for his services, which he is happy to provide. This will be the same upper room that the disciples hide in when Jesus is arrested and put to death. This is the same upper room that 120 disciples wait and pray for the Holy Spirit. This is the same upper room that the Holy Spirit descends upon them like tongues of fire a special space for ministry verse 14 and when the hour came he reclined at table on the apostles with him and he said to them i have earnestly desired to eat this passover with you before i suffer for i tell you i will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of god there jesus is with his apostles all 12. did he eat the passover or did he not it sounds like maybe he didn't eat it, but he he what he's probably saying is I I have eaten this meal right, but will not eat it again with you until we eat it in the kingdom of God. There's no mention of a lamb being eaten, which is symbolic, which is important during the Passover feast, because it uh, the the lamb. Is, is symbolic of a sacrificial lamb for the atoning of sins. So it could be that Jesus has chosen to celebrate Passover before the day of Passover. Another reason why it could be Wednesday, not Thursday. Had it been Thursday, the day of Passover, there would have been a lamb to eat. Why is this important? The lamb is missing. Who is the lamb? Jesus is the lamb. Had it been Thursday, he probably would have. He pro had it been Thursday, he probably would not have done what he's going to do next. What he's going to do next has been uh, uh, honored and practiced and uh, 
followed by churches for thousands of years. Jesus, knowing that he's going to die, has planned the last meal a day early to give greater importance to what he does next. Verse 17, And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave it, and he gave him thanks, and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me at the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. This is called the Last Supper. This is not called the Last Passover. Another reason why it could be Wednesday. Because Jesus did not set out to end Passover, to end Judaism, Right? He came to bring something new. A new covenant. Passover still has its place in Judaism. And the Last Supper, Holy Communion, has its place in Christianity. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus is our Passover. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Another reason no lamb mentioned at this last meal, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Two elements Jesus used, the cup and the bread. It appears that Jesus did not drink from the cup. He has his reasons, not until the kingdom of God comes. The cup is his blood of the new covenant, the body is the bread is his body, broken and given for you. The new covenant, what does it say? The new covenant says this, that God will be our God, that his word will be in our minds and in our hearts, and that our sins will be forgiven forever. That's what the new covenant says. Both the cup and bread we consume in remembrance of him. We remember his body. We remember the blood he poured out. His body heals us. And his blood forgives us. Look, Jesus knows Judas is going to betray him. The Gospel of John tells us that Judas left at the time that the bread was given. He didn't stick around. The betrayal of Judas is prophesied. It will happen, but the death of Judas is not prophesied. Judas had his opportunities to repent and seek forgiveness. We are told that, that Judas committed suicide. He hung himself and his, his bowels gushed out. Satan leads people to death. Jesus leads people to eternal life. The apostles did not know it was Judas. The enemy puts on a good act, but God knows the heart. We're going to read about Peter soon. Judas was no worse than Peter. And Peter no better than Judas. But what we learn soon is the difference between repentance and and remorse. Remorse is feeling shamed and, and sad and, and grieving over a decision, but repentance is turning back to the Lord. Let's continue. Verse 24, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? 
is it not the one the the one who reclines at table but i among you as the one who serves you are those who have stayed with me in my trials and i assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel probably john and james started this dispute this is a, seems to be a, a discussion argument that occurs quite often. Uh, remember that when John and James asked to sit on one on the left and one on the right, they were already getting their positions ready for the kingdom. And when they did that, it angered the others. We're not told it was them, but it could have been them who got the apostles all riled up. The kingdom is coming. Who will be the greatest? Who will have the highest honor? Uh, who will have great privilege to rule beside Jesus? You know, Jesus does not correct them for wanting to be great. Jesus is always good at correcting with gentleness. Instead, he shows them how. The desire is good, but the method of greatness must be his way. Don't be like the Gentiles. Be different. Be set apart. Don't rule over each other. That's what the Gentiles do. You want to be great? Be like the youngest, not the oldest. Those who sit back and relax and eat at the table are considered the greatest, not the servant. Okay, yes, of course, that's true. But Jesus says, not so with you. Look, look at me. I am your example. I am the greatest, yet I serve you. The true path to greatness is servitude. You desire to be great, you must be servants. Their reward is amazing. They will possess the kingdom, right? They will sit at the Lord's table and they will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And in the book of Revelation, uh, uh, in the city of the new Jerusalem, the foundation of the city walls will be the names of the apostles. Great reward awaits them verse 31 simon simon behold satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat but i have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and when you have turned again strengthen your brothers peter said to him lord i am ready to go with you both to prison and to death jesus said i tell you peter the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me satan did something similar to Job. He asked God to put Job to the test. And God approved. Satan took away his health, Job's health, his wealth, his children, and drove a wedge between his wife and his friends. Yet we learn that Job persevered. Job did not curse God. And God restored back to Job what Satan took away. Listen to this. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. God can make it that your latter days are better than the beginning. Peter's latter days will be more than his denial and failure. Praise be to God, the God of restoration and abundance. Satan wants uh, to put you, Peter, to the test, to sift you, to separate the wheat from the chaff, you know. Let's, let's see if uh, Peter really loves you. Let's see if he trusts you. Let's see if he really believes that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's see if he really has faith in you. I will sift him like wheat. Jesus intercedes for Peter. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus knows that he's going to fall, yet he will turn back and be strength to his brothers. Oh, that Jesus might pray for us, and he does. 
Even now, we are told that Jesus intercedes for his saints day and night. Jesus is our high priest, praying on our behalf to the Father. We do have Jesus praying for us. Peter is sincere and confident in himself. He is ready and willing to go to prison and to die with Jesus. Jesus knows Peter, then he knows himself. I know you have faith in me, Peter, yet you will deny me, Peter. As a matter of fact, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows this day. It's, it's, not, it's not the faith of Peter in Jesus that fails. It's his witness of Jesus. It's his witness. The Lord knows the heart of man. He knows the heart of Peter. His denial uh, will weaken him, but his unending love will restore him. And Peter will become a witness for the Lord, a great witness. Verse 35, and he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. You sent us out with nothing. We had nothing and we lacked nothing. We learn by your words that God will provide. Verse 36, and he said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. Why the change in instructions? Because Jesus knows that he's going to die and go away. Take your money bag. Take your knapsack and take a sword, a sword for protection. Is the Lord going to stop providing? No, the Lord will provide. In the, they will prepare, and in that preparation, the Lord will provide. They're getting ready to go out to the world. What a huge mission. And they must be prepared for that mission. Verse 39, and he went out. And he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a, about a th stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. There's a spiritual battle taking place. A spiritual battle unseen, but very much affecting their physical reality. Satan is tempting Jesus once again, just like he did in the wilderness before he began his ministry. He's at work behind the scenes. He is the tempter. Pray in times of trial and struggle. Pray that you may not enter into temptation because we are weak. Jesus prays. He prays. Uh, he, he asked the Father to remove the cup. The cup of what? The cup of judgment. The, the cup of God's judgment will be poured out on Jesus for you. The Lord does not fear death. The fierce wrath of God's judgment caused great agony and, and he endured. He endured what God poured out upon him and because he did it for you. He did it for me. 
He always submits to the will of God, not his own. And we must learn to submit to God's will, trusting that he knows the beginning and the end, that he sees what we can't see. And his will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Notice an angel from heaven came to Jesus and strengthened him. A servant of heaven helping the servant of servants here on earth. He is the servant of all servants and he is the king of all kings. Help was provided. The agony is so intense that Jesus sweats. Luke says that his sweat was like great drops of blood doesn't he doesn't uh, he doesn't say that it was blood it was like great drops of blood where did Jesus draw his strength from prayer to the father he found his strength in God the father I've noticed I don't know about you but the enemy puts believers to sleep when God is speaking all of a sudden there's uh, closed eyes and people get tired so this must be uh, an intense spiritual battle taking place. He might be putting them to sleep so that they don't pray. Instead of praying, they are sleeping, probably not grasping the gravity of the situation. They are being spiritually attacked. Jesus is about to be arrested, put on trial, and crucified. Could this be one of the reasons why Peter denied Jesus? One of the contributing factors is that he wasn't praying when he ought to be, right? We too must ask ourselves, how is my prayer life with God? Verse 47, while he was still speaking, there came a crowd and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas knew where Jesus would be, where Jesus spent his time in prayer. This is an opportune time away from the crowd. A kiss, we know this, is a demonstration of love and affection. Judas deceitfully used intimate knowledge of location in an act of love to portray him. Verse 49, and when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Well, we know there's two swords. Jesus did not tell them to use the sword for violence. Better to use it for protection. Even better, use the sword of the word of God to fight spiritual battles. Verse 50, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Peter was the one. This is Peter. He struck the servant of the high priest, cut off his, his right ear, and the name of that man was Malchus. In verse 51, but Peter, but uh, Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out as against a robber? with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Without God's approval, the enemy could not lay a single hand on Jesus. They tried many times, but Jesus would just slip away. It wasn't his hour. It wasn't his time. Now the hour has come, the time of his suffering and death. The enemy has no power over God unless God gives his approval. And God gives his approval according to his divine wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. God sees the beginning and the end. God knows why Jesus is dying on the cross to forgive the sins of the world. Jesus points out that they arrest him at night, showing, you know, how wicked their act is. In the secrecy, in the darkness of night they come from. Showing, uh, revealing what's in their heart as well. 
verse 54. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Peter was not praying when the Lord told him to pray. Peter was distant when he should have been close to the Lord. And Peter chose to sit at the fire of the enemy. These are contributing factors to his denial. He failed at being a witness for Jesus Christ. We are, we are uh, more likely to deny Jesus when we're not praying, when we're distant, and we're sitting at the fire of the enemy when we are far from him. While the words of denial were coming out of his mouth, the rooster crowed. Peter heard the rooster crow as the words left his mouth. Verse 61, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Jesus looked right at Peter, and I know it was a look of love and understanding. No doubt, the eyes of the Lord are eyes of love. Then Peter remembered uh, Jesus said that he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. Just like that, Peter had failed the Lord. Peter believed himself strong, but he is weak. He is broken. The Lord has great plans for Peter, but for now he must face his failure. Verse 63, Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept saying, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many things against him, blaspheming him. The blows the blows upon Jesus are, are worse because he's blindfolded, right? Jesus cannot uh, brace himself for the impact. He cannot see which direction the punches are coming from. And they beat him without guilt or conviction. They take it upon themselves to punish him and add insults. In appearing to be righteous, they dishonor the Son of God. Verse 66, when day came, so now it's day. Whether it's Thursday or Friday, what's ultimately of most importance is Jesus' purpose to suffer and die for the sins of the world. His death will change the world forever. This day has meaning because Jesus gives it meaning. His trial at night goes against God's law. They broke God's law by doing it at night, so they will try him again during the day. The assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. When it's not clear what's happening, a look at the reaction of the religious leaders. Look at that reaction. They ask him, are you the son of God? Jesus says, you say that I am. 
In other words, you say it because I am. You heard, you heard yourselves, did you not? We all heard it. He just claimed to be the son of God. He claims to be equal with God. What man can sit at the right hand of power? They're furious because they know exactly what Jesus said. Jesus is the son of God. And more so, he is the I am. He is the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. He is, I am, that I am. He is Yahweh. He is God in the flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us. And he came in Jesus full of grace and truth. The truth of Jesus' identity has the power to save us and, and transform our lives. Praise be to God. We'll stop right there. Let's pray and we'll close. Uh, dear God, thank you for your word. The time has come for Jesus to, to suffer and to die. He's betrayed by one who followed. It's in us too, Lord, to betray. It's in us too to deny you. Pray for us, Lord, that we would be strong and that we would persevere and endure. Thank you for the cup of your blood and the bread of your body for giving us a meaningful way to remember you your suffering, and your death. Thank you for Holy Communion, the Last Supper. Thank you for showing us how to be great through service. For showing us time and time again that you are in control. Nothing escapes you. Nothing passes you by. Everything filters through the love of God. It was all planned, ordained for victory. Thank you that you chose to be obedient to the Father, to follow the will of the Father. Help us to, to learn, to trust, to depend, to be confident and persuaded in the will of God, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Praise be to God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.